chapter 1, second, I was very excited about preaching this again and putting some more meat on the bone of this. Uh, Sunday morning we talked about B. Onesimus, and Onesimus of course was a runaway slave. Being a runaway slave, he did something for Paul, but we want to go a little deeper with it tonight if we can. Uh, Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 16, 2 Timothy 1, 16, are you comfortable? Let me give you a chance while you're standing to testify. Amen. If you've got a testimony tonight you'd like to share, I'd love to hear from you. Real quick, I'll get somebody to get a mic to you if you need it. Anyone real quick? I'm going to say, I'm going to repeat you so they can hear it online. Dana Rankin said God has been so good in her life. He's constantly providing. He amazes you. looks after you, redhead. Amen. How old's your oldest? 19. We've been together 19 years, Dana. Amen. Amazing. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. All right, guys. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. The Lord give mercy into the house of Onesimus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain or my imprisonment. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and he found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, you know very well. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the ministry of refreshment, for being refreshed by people. How could we get where we're at now without being refreshed by friends, family, and believers? We ask your blessing upon this house, those that are watching. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, you can be seated. He says here, he oft refreshed me. He refreshed me often. The word refresh means to give intermission from labor, to give you a break. Amen. It's that Kit Kat bar ministry. Amen. Give somebody a break. How I many know every now and then you just need a break? Yeah, not the way things have gone in 2020, we need people of refreshing that can give us a break. So captivity has, uh, has the capacity to bring out both the best and the worst in people. And Paul is in captivity in Rome. He's in prison. When we read about Paul, it's his final days. And, and, you know, in just reading the portion of his last, these, when you read Timothy, 1st and 2nd Timothy, these are the last words of Paul the Apostle, even though you see Titus after that and Philemon, these are his last words. So he was beheaded after this. So in understanding that, at some point prior to this last letter, he had been sent out of prison by Nero. He had immediately settled back into preaching the gospel. Amen. He enjoyed the company of Philemon, his new friend Onesimus. He was reunited by his son in the faith, Timothy. And it is certain that he continued to pour wisdom, understanding, and grace into all these men when they fellowship, but his freedom did not last long, and suddenly he finds himself confined to a chain once more. He's arrested in Troas, hauled back to Rome, tossed back into a dungeon, dark and dingy. You know, they didn't have prisons like we do today. When you read about their prisons, man, it's, it's terrible. It's not fit for humans to be in. The odors of sweat, dried blood permeate the place. The fear of torture hangs like a fog over it. You could hear people being tortured. There in that dungeon, the gloomy chambers there in that prison. And from this hole, Paul pins the words that we just read. And he talked about this young man, Onesimus, who was a man who refreshed him. Nero was about to take off the head of Paul somewhere around 67 A.D. He was the greatest New Testament missionary. He wrote most of his books while he was in prison. He was a church planner. And he dies in a disease-ridden, vermin-infested place. It doesn't seem fair, does it? Amen. For somebody to have been so great in the gospel. But he would be, you know, how we, we celebrate quarterbacks today. and We celebrate uh, uh, certain uh, Hollywood figures. We, we celebrate certain uh, uh, superstars. Paul would have been that guy. Man, he would have been the guy that we would all went after. But here he is now, the end of his life, and he's in this place. Another thing that doesn't seem fair is that Paul's in his final days. He's alone. He's almost alone. He talks about this runaway slave, Onesimus, who came to refresh him. It appears that Luke was nearby, but the mass of people that he influenced and brought the gospel to weren't there to help him. And I'm sure that Timothy probably was quite disturbed when he read Paul's words, amen, when he sent them out to him. And he, he uses a phrase, and I read it again today, that I'm about ready to be poured out like a drink offering, that my departure is very soon. I mean, he knew that. And so by the time Timothy gets the letter, Paul's already in heaven. Amen. It would go something that quick. And it hits me that oftentimes at the end of one's life, the last place you want to be is alone. That's why this pandemic is so demonic to me is it separates people that they can't connect and be back around one another. As I get older, I realize that I, I want to be useful till I'm gone. 
I want to stay useful until I'm gone. I don't want to wait to the end. I, I was talking with my pastor on the way here. You know, I do it on Sunday, so today I gave him a call, and, and uh, we, we, get, we chit-chatted some. And he brought up A.D. Van Hoos. A.D. Van Hoos was in his late 80s when he passed away. He pastored a great church in Evansville, Indiana. He passed it down to his son, Rick. And that's the man that pastored. And it's my pastor's pastor. And there was a time, and as I'm telling about Onesimus and Paul's life, he, looks, he tells me on the phone, he says, when, when uh, A.D. Van Hoos got older, he talked to me and he said, Mike, I'm, I can help any church out. I have international ministries. I have started churches all over the world. I've done missions work, and now nobody wants me. And I want to tell you, it's the saddest place to get in life when you feel like you've poured into the lives of people, you've blessed other people, you've, and as a pastor, you've, you've been a part of helping other churches grow and be, believing with them through hard times and then get close to the end and nobody wants you. And I said, God, I would rather you take me first before I ever get to this place. And I think that's where Paul was. He knew that, in it, actually, as far as I know, he's in his late 40s when, he's, when he dies. So he gets to a place where he, where he knows, hey, I'm alone. Nobody really wants me. But, but here's the thing you've got to be careful of that you do not get too caught up with needing recognition and appreciation down here. Because the truth is, the more you want recognition and appreciation and the more you fish for it on Facebook and Instagram and other places, the more you're going to be disappointed. Amen. The bottom line is this, your reward will be on the other side. Amen. It's not here. People may not recognize you. They may actually forget about you as they get older. Amen. But it's going to be on the other side, and it's crucial to keep that in mind. The devil loves to take some of God's choicest servants and work their minds over in the waning hours of their life. I've seen great men and women get close to the end, and all of a sudden, crazy things start happening in their life, and they start acting crazy. And I think to myself, man, don't, don't throw it all away. Amen. Believe God till the end. Can I get an Amen. Again, Paul goes on to say in chapter 4, verse 6, he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight, guys. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not only to me, but also to all them that love his appearing. So when I read this about Paul, he knew he was on his way out. He knew this is the last prison he would be in. This is the last place. So I'm going to tell you something, that I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And not only for me, but for you also. If you'll believe with me, it's going to happen for you. And with those final words, they executed Paul. And at that moment, he was set free from the attack to this life. Let me say it again. When you leave this world, you are set free from the attachments of this life. You are no longer connected here, but you got a new life. So it was painful, no doubt, but well rewarded because of his faith, faithfulness. Now let's talk a little bit more about Onesimus. I want to draw your attention to the preceding verse in this chapter, 2 Timothy 1.15. This thou knowest, that all they which were in Asia turned away from me. In other words, those who were once with me turned away. Why did they turn away, Paul? Because you were put in jail? Uh, because uh, all of a sudden you're not famous like you once were? Your, your TV ministry went downhill? Uh, why, why did they turn away from you? He said, of whom are Philegius? He even mentions their name. And her Hermogenes. Amen. These guys turned away from me. So when you get your name in the Bible because you rejected and turned away from God's man, that's a, that's a terrible reason to get your name there. Amen. So in contrast to the actions and attitudes of many, there was one man who was kind to Paul. In the middle of all this, man, Paul makes reference to this man who brought great comfort to him. He was a man who helped him. His name means help bringer, Onesimus. He's a help bringer. Amen. Paul stressed that this man refreshed him in the middle of his struggling with his chains and in jail. 2 Timothy 1.16, but may the Lord have mercy on the household of Onesimus many times. Did that man put fresh heart? Put a fresh heart. Amen. When you, sometimes you need a heart transplant. You need a new heart. You need somebody to come along and bless you, love you, care for you, forget whatever it takes, lift you back up out of where you're at, and put a fresh heart back in you. I'd say amen all the time to that one. I want people like that around me all the time. J.B. Phillips says it. Put a fresh heart in me. We all need that kind of ministry. And perhaps more importantly, we need to be the person who gives themselves to refreshment. You know, if maybe I'm not getting it because I'm not reciprocating it. I haven't put it into somebody else. Hadn't blessed somebody else. Many of you know that I, sp I served time in jail. Amen. And while I was in jail, you know, I wasn't there but a couple of nights uh, in Austin. I'd been arrested three times. Finally had to serve some uh, my sentence out. And I, I got into it. I do not remember. I know that I, I'm not an agitator. 
So I don't know what happened, but me and this guy got into it, and, and he's across the, the cell. There were 20, uh, 22 of us in this cell block. Amen. So I got into it with him, and he come after me across the cell block. I, was, I knew by looking at his stature, I was no match for him. But the guy that got up off that top, uh, the bottom bunk and stood between me and him was... His name was Carlos Bertigas, and he looked like Lou Ferrigno in Mexican skin. I mean, the guy was just huge, olive-skinned guy, and uh, dark-headed, and, and he backed that guy down, and he shut him up, and he became my friend in, in jail. He refreshed me. And until you've been there and had somebody put a fresh heart in you, you don't understand the power of that. Matter of fact, Carlos became a, a member of my church. Both All the churches I've pastored, he was murdered some years ago, I think eight or nine, ten years ago on 610. Somebody shot, it was a road rage, shot through his truck. His, his boys, his twin boys were six-year-old then. They're 19 now. So I'll tell you they, something about the progress that has, has taken place. And, uh, uh, you know, he refreshed me. So I know that, that what Paul's talking about here, to have somebody on your side. But the requirements to refresh first, it's about killing your pride. You know, Carlos could have laid there on Esmus, didn't have to seek Paul out. But he said he was not ashamed of my chains. He was not ashamed of who I was. He knew my past. He knew where I came from. And yet he said, you know, Onesimus was not ashamed of me. We are all susceptible to moments of pride that rob us from blessings. Imagine the stigma that Paul had on his life at that time. He was now not just in jail, but he was on death row. From all of the physical abuse he'd endured, it's doubtful his appearance was anything to look at. He hadn't bathed. He probably smelt. Amen. Yet Onesimus loved him because he brought the gospel to him. Amen. The scripture says, to much has been given, to, to much you be a blessing too. And to much you've been forgiven, that you should also forgive. So this young man evidently felt he'd been forgiven of a lot of stuff. He wanted to ease the suffering that Paul was going through with his chains in jail. It meant he was going to have to risk. If you're going to refresh and encourage someone, you're going to discover that there's a cost involved with it. You know, uh, a month or so ago, we went to Louisiana to be a blessing to Kenneth. I know that you guys went up uh, uh, to uh, on Alaska after the tornado went through. You don't know what that does for people. We went to Florida and helped a pastor out there. Now we're, we're very close together to refresh somebody when they're going through hard times. And the reason why is that we have been refreshed. Amen. I'll never forget Bishop Bob Utz coming down from California in December. Well, we worked September, October, November. By December, we were wore out after dealing with Hurricane Harvey. And he showed up with, with I don't know, two, three van loads of guys. Some of them flew in. And they worked. And we worked. We, we let them hunt. I, we let one guy, he, he shot a... a a hog, and it was just crazy stuff from California boys, but it was refreshing. And now we still continue to connect with one another. Kenneth continually sends me a message. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for being there for me and my family and my son, his family. You know, that's the kind of stuff this church does. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. It's very important. It's not likely that any of us will have the opportunity to refresh someone like a Paul. But we're surrounded with people who have their own chains their own sufferings, their own confinement that pull on them. And chains don't, they don't so much uh, blister the skin as, as much as they erode the soul. Amen. Let me say it again. Chains don't so much blister the skin as much as they erode the soul. The chains of failure, the chains of past scars and painful wounds, the chains of a habit that returns, the chains of violent temper that resurfaces, the chains of poor self-image, unemployment, financial pressure, the past, chains of, of a future you're scared to face, chains of a fear that paralyzes from an unseen virus, chains of depression, chains of physical and emotional abuse. Chains don't have to be physical. Amen. They can be something that deals with your soul. So don't be ashamed of the chain that belongs to somebody. It's part of their identity. You know, oftentimes them chains will leave scars. And then it reminds you of where you came from. Amen. What happened in your life. But most of all, it is an opportunity for you to give yourself to the ministry of refreshment. If we are not careful, we can be too big to do something small. And too small to do something big. The church needs men and women who will kill their pride and prejudice long enough to do something for the kingdom. I never want to get to this place where I think I'm too big for something small or too small for something big. Amen. I think it's time to let the line roar. Can I get an amen? Amen. Don't get too important to help a man who has a chain. It very well could be that on the end of that chain is the Apostle Paul. 
Amen. You don't always know who you're helping. So, so first, it's very important if you're going to be a refresher. Amen. It's about killing your pride. Second, it's about responsibility. Timothy 1.17, 2 Timothy says, But when he was in Rome, he sought me. He sought me. He went after me. I sent a picture of this beautiful, tall, horned eight point that's on my camera to my pastor on my way here. And I said, I'm hunting him. Now, I might get other deer before I get him, but that's the one I'm after. If I, if I get to him before Don or David or Joseph does, but he's on my camera right now, so I know I've got him coming in. I'm hunting him. That's how Onesimus was. He was hunting Paul. He had a picture of him on his cell phone, and he went after him. In Rome, I diligently, he diligently sought me out and found me. Diligent means to dig after. Such a ministry is also about being able to be reliable, dependable, Perhaps responsible might be the best word to use. Our age needs people who are steady under pressure and who are willing to adjust to the work. Whatever happens tomorrow, I'll pray you're steady under the pressure. Amen. You make life better, not bitter. There are times that if you're going to give yourself to the ministry of refreshment, you will have to seek out. And by the way, you don't have to be in the ministry to give the ministry of refreshment. I believe we're all ministers of the gospel. Amen. Amen. So we all do that. You will have to seek out opportunities to do it. Amen. The New International Version says this way. He searched hard for me until he found me. Where was Paul? He was in Rome. Where was the last place he met Onesimus? We'll talk about it at the end. In, in Ephesus. So this boy, this young man, this slave sought after Paul till he found him. Onesimus had a sense of responsibility about him, and it mo motivated him to work. You know, I got a feeling he was a man who buried himself in the work of the church. He, he loved the church life. And this is how great churches are built, by people who are willing to shoulder the responsibility, do the work of the ministry of refreshment. You know, great churches don't just happen. This church didn't just happen. People had to refresh one another. I stand at this pulpit, and I remember the work that went on to build all of this and to put it up. And a lot, a lot of the people that did it, the men and women, I've already prayed over and sent on to the kingdom of God. They've already passed from this life. Amen. But they were involved in building this building and putting it together. And they were, every now and then, we had to stop and refresh one another. I find out this all the time. If, if you, every now and then, you've got to stop to celebrate. If not, all you're going to do is tolerate. And in life... You know, if whatever you tolerate will never change. So there are times I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with stuff, and I'll stop and take a break. I said, i got to celebrate. That's why I cooked that backstrap age today. Amen. It was just a time to take a little break, eat a little backstrap. Oh, come on, Jesus. Amen. It was celebrating time. Responsibility rings out of the passage of this scripture. He sought me out very diligent. He searched hard. This means traveling the high stormy seas to Asia to Italy. He had to leave Ephesus in Asia and go all the way across. You remember Paul going across? He shipwrecked in Malaysia. To there, this young man went that same way. He was seeking after him. In an age where there was no email, texting, or, or cell phones, anything of that nature, he had to hunt this man down. All he knew is he was going to Rome to see Caesar in prison there. This means putting life on hold for an extended period of time. Hey, guys, I'll be back to deal with you later. I got to go find Paul. This means leaving the warmth of family and the camaraderie of friends. I love you guys. This probably won't take long, but I need to go find this man. He's touched my life. This means getting there at your your own expense. It may cost you to do the will of God. But Onesimus was a noble-minded, strong-hearted man who had determined to give himself to the ministry of refreshment. That kind of devotion will knit the hearts of people in church together. It'll knit your heart to a new friend. It'll connect you. I'm looking for new folk over the next year. I really am. Brand new people come in here. You know, I look over and I just want to throw them out by name because they're not in here. But when I think of James and Annie, it was like God brought them in here, guys. Amen. What a refreshing they've been. And, uh, I, you know, it's just... It just tickles me. <laughs> Maybe I just love Annabelle. <laughs> but, but they're refreshing. Amen. Amen. So I appreciate Sammy, you guys, breath, bringing them in. A mountain climber, Charles Houston, who overcame a climate disaster in the Himalayan mountain ranges in 1953, wrote about what happens when men are concerned more about themselves. He wrote, when men climb on a great mountain together, the rope between them is more than a mere physical aid to the ascent. It is a symbol of men banded together in a common effort of will and strength, fighting against their own true enemies, inertia, cowardness, greed, ignorance, and all weakness of the human spirit. The only way to make it up the mountain was to hold the rope and believe for the, your brother that was in front and pull your brother from behind you. The ministry of refreshment is a call to responsibility. We'll, we'll pull a church together. You've got to give yourself to it. And last point, it has its reward. 
And I think this is the blessing that God adds on the end of it. You know what? If you're kind like this, it's a reward. I, I've been rewarded. I thank you, by the way, the, for the, all the appreciation I've received over the last few weeks as your pastor. It's a reward to me. 2 Timothy 1.18. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus. Thou knowest very well. Paul gives us a small hint. And he defines the geographic location that Onesimus was in. Ephesus. The book of Ephesians. He brings out Ephesus. Very well that he could have been one of the elders there. Paul spent three years in Ephesus. And that is a long time to get to know someone. Acts chapter 20 verse 31. I close with this. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God. And to the word of his grace, which can build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. And everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The business about the greater blessing being the, the one that gives, was like a tiny seed that lodged somewhere in the soul of Onesimus. Now again, when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, you know, and I have a feeling that he was one of those men who was watering that seed with his weeping as he watched Paul board that ship that day out of Ephesus. Because it was Paul that said, he refreshed me at Ephesus. I knew him at Ephesus. He says that in 2 Timothy. So he gives this little hint that he might have been there. So here's my mind working. Because after this, Paul gets in a ship and pushes himself away. The Bible says they cried. We tore ourselves away from him. We wept. When I, I remember preaching this for funerals because it reminds me of certain people that leave us. We, we weep when we tear ourselves away from them. So he goes on to say that. So here I am reading this and re recognizing that Paul said, I knew him in Ephesus. So that means that this runaway slave leaves Philemon, steals to get to wherever he's at, Ends up in Ephesus under the feet of Paul, a man who has a, a death penalty on his neck. He's listening to Paul preach, and he knows this man has tremendous influence. And then Paul leaves him and goes to Rome. He goes to Rome after him and stays with Paul in Rome there before he dies, refreshes him. Then Paul writes a letter. Have you ever had anybody in your life? That when they come into it, and all of a sudden you want other people to know what a blessing this person was. Amen. And you write their name down. And, and so he pins it down, Onesimus, and he encourages Philemon to take him back, not only as a, uh, not only as a slave, but as a brother. And if he owes you anything, remember this from Sunday, if he owes you anything, you put that on my account. I got his back. I'll take care of it. Amen. I'll pay either here or later, but I'll take care of it. That's such power. Because in that day, there were slaves and there were masters. And during the day, there was the master and the slave, and the slave did what the master said. But in the church services, often the slaves became elders, which we also read that Onesimus perhaps became a bishop after that. That means that when he went to church, now Onesimus was up here, and Philemon was down there. And Philemon was under Onesimus. You follow this? Amen. That was kingdom thinking that went on. So when I think of this and I see it and I see what God did in this life, I think to myself, my goodness, God, if we could just have a ministry refreshing one another within our families, within our churches, within our employees, amen, em employers, all of this. You know, when he heard that Paul was locked down, he decided that he had to turn to Rome upside down if he had to, to find him and bring him a ministry. Amen. It could have been a, a bottle of water. He, just somehow he refreshed him. They let him in where he could be with Paul to talk to him. And nothing that you do for the kingdom of God will go unnoticed. The scripture says even water given to a prophet will not go unnoticed. So in conclusion, somebody's depending on you. Somebody's needing your encouragement. Somebody needs that phone call. They need that text. They need to hear from you. Amen. And you know people I don't know. And there are people that hadn't been back in this house for six, eight months. Amen. For, for fear of. Uh, different things and you know and again we say you do you but the bottom line is maybe they need a phone call maybe they need to hear from us I, I'm kind of backwards on it I think they ought to be calling me 
Let me know the day out there somewhere. But I'll send them calls out. I'll sit at my desk and I'll flip through my phone. I'll go, well, I hadn't seen that one. I'm going to give them a call. Amen. You've got to do the same thing. Joshua had somebody that refreshed him. You remember his name? Caleb. David had somebody that refreshed him. You remember his name? Jonathan. Amen. Paul had Barnabas and Silas who ran with him and refreshed him. 2 Corinthians 1 3. Did I tell you I was closing? I did. I actually closed and I went back and I grabbed the scripture because I couldn't help myself. All praise to the Lord and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. And I tell folk all the time, let God counsel you. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. Who does? God does. And before you know it, He brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. Amen. Amen. Boy, isn't that the gospel? Amen. Amen. When I'm reading that, I'm thinking, man, you, you couldn't have said that any better. Amen. He, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. And we remind ourselves, you know, well, you know what God did for me when I was going through hard times? When I was grieving, when I was hurting, when I financially busted, and how I got back on my feet. Let me tell you a little something about that. Amen. And next thing you know, you tell that person, that person goes tell somebody else, and somebody else, and somebody else. Amen. And that one miracle you had is moving through other people. Most of us don't realize it, but somewhere we're on the giving end of being an Onesimus and the receiving end of a Paul. We refresh others, and they refresh us. We can't ever afford to throw in the towel of the ministry of refreshment. Amen? Amen. Come on, give God praise tonight before we walk out of here. H.D. will be in the back with a, with a bucket. Amen. And uh, so if you have offerings and, and tithing to give tonight, amen, please drop it in. I thank you for being here tonight. Pray for our nation tonight. Just keep on doing it. And, and not just tonight. How many know that you might need to pray for your nation more, more tomorrow than you did tonight? Amen. It may need it more. And if you'd like to pick up a gator, there's some in the back. Amen. God bless you. And y'all's watching online. Thanks for tuning in. Tell somebody about the little country church in Crosby, New Caney. Till Sunday, we'll see you at 830. Amen. God bless you.